Thank you, Emily. Is this on? Oh, I'm just not talking into it. Is mine on? Yes. I'm weak-wristed, so this is... <laughs> Gotta hold it up. No, boom, yeah. yeah. It's like a selfie stick for holding <laughs> the mic. You need something for that. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Hi, Isaac. Hi, Jason. So you, you wanted to start by reading? Yeah, I wanted to read wonderful something, memoir. that's all right. Yes. Okay. You should. This is something I don't get to read very often, so I'm going to read it tonight in the rare book room. <laughs> it's from a piece called Home Invasions. Home invasions are one of my biggest fears. I don't mean simple burglaries. I'm talking psychotic, symbolic breaches, like in the movies. You know, where some sicko sets out to punish modern bougie excess one house at a time, which is why I try to make my home life as much of a drag as possible, in case there's a potential invader at the window. No trips to Aspen being planned in here. <laughs> Just eating a bowl of Crispix in the dark. <laughs> Often is the night that I lie in bed worrying that the footsteps in the hallway are not the loafers of my pianist neighbor, but the soulless boots of soulless men who will kick in the door and torture me, or even worse, not touch me at all and say they'd rather just be friends. <laughs> not the person with whom you should be enacting a home invasion sex fantasy. The fetish eludes me. And yet there I was at the apartment of a man I did not know, opening the front door that he'd left unlocked for me. Once inside, I followed the only apparent light to its source, his bedroom, where he wanted me to happen upon him. <laughs> I slowly pushed open the door, and sure enough, there he was, prostrate and naked on his bed. I figured at this point we could drop the charade and proceed like normal adults with emotional issues, but but when he rolled over, I noticed he'd blindfolded himself with an Hermes necktie. I paused. This was not part of the plan. I'd never hooked up with a blindfolded person before, someone with no care for what I might look like in real life. Do I say hello? I wondered. Do I make my presence known? I kept quiet and awkwardly began to undress. My belt hitting the floor was Civil War loud. <laughs> saliva caught in my throat and I tried to pass off the subsequent cough as a titillating grunt. Gay Oedipus stirred on the bed. <clears throat> Finally naked, I stared down at him. I thought he might say something or do something, but he didn't, so I sat on his face to ease the tension. <laughs> Gentle readers. <laughs> Of the many things I wish for you, the first is that at some point in your lives, you too get to rest your taints on Hermes. <laughs> for a minute or two, as if I'd sat on an unmanned garden hose, but when I grabbed his dick, he steadied himself. I generally think 69ing is worthless chaos, but it was our only means of communication, a writhing nine tongue stabbing in the dark and a six shouldering the sight burden. He came, and I learned that you can fake a male orgasm when your partner's got her mez around the eyes. We collapsed next to each other, and he removed his blindfold and smiled goofily at me. And then, with deep significance, as if he'd run to meet me at an airport at the end of the movie, kissed me and said, Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry I snorted at some point when you were reading. That's okay. This is this new thing that's happening to me in old age. but it's A snort? Yeah, I started snorting when I think something's really funny. I'm, I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, it's I jolly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the first thing is, is it's, it's the absolute most important thing. That, uh, did, 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 did you write this book and say, I need an entire paragraph for Ryan Felipe? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that first was... Well, it's Felipe. <laughs> um, second. Is it really? Is it Felipe? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Man. Didn't you see that episode of Girls where they corrected each other and then Ryan Philippe like Instagrammed a screenshot of the No, okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the strand. I know we've got a time limit. But um <laughs> Yeah. He he was my uh he he really uh <laughs> I, I say in the book, it was like when people think they see Jesus in a piece of toast. Like when I saw him in I Know What You Did Last Summer, I was like, <laughs> I mean, it just, it just made everything clear to me. I, I just like how you, you made a point to let us know. He got his own paragraph. Book, yeah. It's my book. <laughs> And I'm giving him his own paragraph. So is it always your intention to, to 
because it started out as a stage show, right? It, it, it did. Well, it started as a. I had a blog uh, for many years, and uh, that blog. I, I went to school for playwriting and um, had. Uh, I'm not prolific when it comes to plays, so I was in between play ideas, and I started a blog, and uh, started doing little like scenes on the blog, scenes from the box office, scenes from the subway, scenes from casual sex, and uh, and started to sort of amass all this material, and some friends and I put it together into a stage show, and then I was invited to Ars Nova uh, by Jason Egan, who runs Ars Nova and is a dear friend, and he now directs me um, in everything. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's not here tonight, so I can speak glowingly of him. But um, no, uh, then, then at Ars Nova, we sort of developed it into a solo show, and so uh, definitely through reading the pieces out loud in front of an audience really helped me uh, sort of hone the material and figure out the pacing and timing of each one and um, and then from that stack I began to work on the book yeah. you, you get compared to David Sedaris and is it Sedaris or Sedaris I feel like I'm screwing up everybody's last name tonight I think it's Sedaris Sedaris right? okay. okay Emily so, thank, thank you, you. Uh, rare and, books yeah and, and, and Tina Fey but you know you mentioned writers in, in, in in great points, if you haven't read the book there, John Updike comes up in a wonderful... <laughs> that was great. I have uh, a framed photo of him on my wall. Which and why? I was Skyping with a guy. I thought it was a beautiful photo, and I was, I was in a pretentious period, and, um, and I was Skyping with a guy, and we were showing each other our bodies, and I was on a spinning desk chair, and... It spun around, and I was looking, and I was looking at John. Up, uh, we made eye contact, <laughs> and then my chair spun further, and I hit my head on the door. It was so. <laughs> You'll read about it. <laughs> and, and, and you also mentioned Alice Munro. I love Alice Munro. She comes up. She's one of my favorites. Yeah. yeah. So are you, who, what, what kind of writers influence you? Because you, you know, there's also the Albie, the part where you talk about Albie mm -hmm. for a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I love Edward Albee. I mean, I, my, my favorite, I mean, David Sedaris is, is a huge, I mean, he's sort of the top for me, but also David Rackoff. See, now I'm Rackoff? Yeah, 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 it's right. Oh, God, thanks. I know that one. Um, and Fran Lebowitz, I love Fran Lebowitz, and um, Joan Didion, clinical, piercing Joan Didion. Um, <laughs> And, but also like Billy Collins, you know, on the poetry end, and Mary Oliver, and, uh, you know, I, I, and, but Alice Monroe, who's also very clinical. I mean, just, just, just the writers who are just so precise. Um, I just, I just study, and, um, yeah, those are sort of the biggest. So did you influences. always want to write about yourself? Because you do, you do. No. No. <laughs> no. Um, but when you have such a... <laughs> a flawed character to you write about. Um, <laughs> uh, thrills and spills. Um, no, I mean, beca because I started as, as, as a playwright, uh, you know, I, it didn't initially think that that would be something I would want to write about, but the blog sort of emerged and I began to, you know, really enjoy creative nonfiction and personal essays and uh, really have fun with those and, and see those not just as diary entries, but, but as, as real crafted pieces of writing that you can... Um, that are hard and that take a lot of work and... Um, I don't know. I began to have fun with it. And, and uh, you know, I really only try to tell the stories that I think are funny or that there's something worth, worth telling about it or, or hearing about it. Um, so. What, what's the hardest part about writing about yourself? Um, it's, a good, it's a good question. I don't know. I mean, because there, there definitely was a sort of emotional... Uh, moment of literally like cl like finishing a like almost 300 page book of all your sort of sexual mishaps and dating fumbles and foibles and uh, <laughs> I don't know you 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 feel a bit depleted I think after a while and 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 you learn I'm learning like you you have to start protecting parts of yourselves like you have to you have to have reserves you have to have things that are just sort of off limits for yourself yeah. even um, 
But that being said, you also have to have some skin in the game when you're writing about yourself or else people will not uh, be interested either. So it's sort of that skin in the game. Uh, uh, it's, it's finding that, that mix of, of of risking something by telling the story, but also keeping a healthy distance. That's also just good for the for the craft of it too. You know, to have that distance where you can say, "Oh, I like that this happened," but it really it's a better story without you know, without that or you know, being able to let go of things as well. And and moving from yourself, you also on the trains we were talking about this earlier yeah. the scenes from the trains and i was reading them on the train if, if you haven't read the book yet the train parts you know if you live in new york this it's nobody writes about this it's like comic gold these people on the trains <laughs> but on the trains and also um from from work the observations you make of other people do you do you just write these things down immediately or do you store them and you dwell on them a little bit and a little of both. Yeah. I mean, some things, like when I slept with that guy who turned out to be the furry. That's, oh my god. The minute he was out the door, I was like, Aah! Write down every goddamn thing he said! Uh, <laughs> that was that was amazing. And there are people uh, in, in my former jo the job I just left, but uh, I was a box office manager for 12 years off Broadway, and and just the interactions with the customers and these, for lack of a better word, intimate, uh, insane moments with people. Um, I, I would I would make little notes, you know. I would I would write little things down, and I would try to remember sort of landmarks in the conversation. But other things, I mean, they, they would be interactions that sort of you know, I would think about for days, they, they would sort of marinate as well. Um, so, so it wasn't always immediately clear to me yeah. what would be a story or what wouldn't. Um, I mean, I don't go on to Grindr like looking, being like, you look dramaturgically promising. Uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you look like you've got an arc. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I I, I try to be op I try to be open, and I and I definitely try to listen as much as possible. One of the things that I, I loved so much is, you know, there are so many of these uh, like these goodbye to all that essays. Mm -hmm. You know, people just want to leave New York, and you seem to Go. still have this. Yeah, that's it. You still seem enthusiastic about it, and you still seem. <laughs> You're, you know, you're, you're getting so much great material from the people around you. Yeah. Do you think you could have written these stories if you lived anywhere else? Well, I'm from Baltimore, which definitely has a lot of characters yeah. as well. Um, no, I mean, I think, uh, I th and that, that, was, that was one of our concerns going into the book, you know, is this too New York? Is this too, I don't know, but, uh, too of a place? But, but then, you know, we were also like, well, people love New York. People love reading about New York. It's very um, accessible. It's what people are watching. It's what I watched growing I mean, I was like Felicity 24-7 and <laughs> was really ready to move here and have my hair <laughs> flouncing around and just making lattes and <laughs> being like, boys, calm down. Uh, <laughs> None of that happened. Uh, no, I love New York. I think it's. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I mean, I. God, no, I'm not the first person to say this. But but if you if you listen to it, it will tell you stories and um, and they and they become your own mm -hmm. as well. Um, I, I mean, I kind of feel like there are two kinds of people that move here. They're the kinds of people that move here because they want to be lawyers or they want to be stockbrokers and make... I don't you know, know those yeah. people. I, I, I wish I knew more of those people. Me too. And then there's everybody, there's all of us, you know, probably probably all of us here, you know, who've moved here because... And how do you stay... You know, I know a lot of people get cynical living here and it's... It gets tough, but how, how do you stay enthusiastic? Because you seem to have this enthusiasm. That's what one of the things that actually surprised me though, because when people write about New York, they're not enthusiastic. You seem to, mm. how do you stay enthusiastic about New York, about working a job you don't like, about bad relationships, that, that, like one night well, relationships? you put it like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, Rosé. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it helps. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's uh, it comes and goes. I don't always love it. I mean, it's I, I don't think 
I think in a way we all love it, but we don't necessarily like it yeah. all the time. I mean, it's it's a hard place to live. It's a it's a it's a isolating place to live. I mean, you really, as as we get older and out further and further away from school, and people pair off. I mean, it's you you get farther and far. You know, it's it's just it just happens. You know, we sort of get farther from each other, and uh, it's it's work to stay connected and in communication with people and um, I, I, th I think that is just have it, having good friends and and having a sense of humor and drinking and uh, I don't know I don't know I don't know that I'm answering your question yeah. but I it, it comes and goes like tonight a night like tonight outside it's kind of hard to yeah that was hard that was gross <laughs> I'm glad the air's on yeah for the rare books <laughs> Um, we, we were talking earlier, though, the, the, the way the book is set up also is, I found that really interesting. It's not quite a memoir, but it is mm. sort of a memoir. It's got yeah. poems, it's got the observations of people. It's, how did you come to set the book up the way it came out? It, um, it, it was sort of born out of the, the, the various features and, and uh, types of pieces that were on the blog and in the show. I think when I turned in the first draft, it was like 130 pieces, which is just not a book. Um, so I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I had to learn. I had, you know, a great team of people helping me at Scribner and, uh, I, I had to I had to learn you know so, sort of a different the the different pace uh, you know of the internet and a blog where things are all in digestible bits versus a book where something needs to breathe and something needs to uh, I, I don't know pa paint a, paint a larger picture I mean it, it was a I I was sort of resistant to the to the term memoir or think you know because I didn't think I had a sort of memoir worthy life I mean I wasn't you know sobbing on any banisters or anything so I just you know I didn't um, I, I didn't want to sort of posit that out there that like I'm writing a memoir so I, but um, but it was explained to me you know that when when you're reading a book you know it th there's a, there's a difference between going and seeing someone on stage or in a show or on the internet or you know where you can visually look at them and you can sort of learn things about them from their uh, just their person, you know, their their energy in the room and how they're speaking. And a book, you don't you don't have that visual thing immediately. So uh, you know, readers need a little more. They need to know, you know, it was sort of phrased like, we need to know more about you. We need to know about your child, just a little bit about your childhood, a little bit about, you know. My editor said, who was the first person you hooked up with on Manhunt? And I was like, oh God, who was the first person I hooked up? You know, but it it was the the moment I sat down and thought about it. It, it 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 was a learn it was a growth moment for me because I learned you sort of you sort of need those helping uh, th those bits of context and I actually had fun writing those those parts. Um, but that being said, I still wanted it. You know, we did a lot of I did a lot of combining pieces and fleshing things out and cutting things and making them a little more literary as opposed to <laughs> bloggy. Um, but I still wanted the book to have a, a, a sort of New York pace. I wanted it to have a, a collage effect, you know, a, a sort of, n not following a linear narrative, but having a, um, you know, a, a sort of, a sort of, um, a thoughtful arc to it, um, where, where there are a lot of pieces and you don't quite know where it's headed, but hopefully it, it, they land somewhere. Um, so there's one there's one line uh, where you describe a guy's penis as heavy like a cheap bodega flashlight in your hand. Yeah, and I thought that was one of the best. We can all feel it, right? <laughs> it, was, it was it was one of the best descriptions of a human body part I've ever read in my life. Uh, but when, well, thanks. What are you writing? That? If I've contributed anything. You've done it. <laughs> Um, did, What's that? Was that something you had? Uh, just like, a, just like a, that's an example. But did you have to come up with that right away, or did you have to like keep toying with it and get the right? Because I mean, there is a comic effect to a lot of your stories. Dick talk. Um, yeah. I love writing about dicks. I think I think they're just. Oh my God! There are just a million <laughs> ways to describe it. You know, um, that that I will say came to me pretty quickly. That one, but but just be, just because. 
Uh, oh boy. Um, <laughs> Just because I, uh, no, no, it was a hurricane time, so I did buy, yeah, I bought a cheap bodega flashlight, and I was standing in line because it was the bodega and everyone had come in, and so I was in line in an hour, and I'm just like holding it. <laughs> just but, those magic moments, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, my mother brought out that line as well. Yeah. <laughs> she just, she, not in those glowing terms. She also texted me the other day and asked, because I have a line about, about hooking up with guys in various apartments in my neighborhood and how much I love comparing apartments. And that's one of the, you know, delights of hooking up, sleeping around. Uh, and, um, and there's the line, uh, Someday I want to suck an eight in a classic six. And my mother <laughs> texted me, what does it mean to <laughs> suck an eight in a classic six? And what did so you I tell her? So I write that back. Did you I said it's an, it's an eight inch male part. <laughs> In a in a really wonderful New York, you know, a part, you know, a really rare New York kind of apartment that everyone's excited about. Um, I tried to really lead with the apartment, you know, like really explain that. That's good. Uh, <laughs> um, since we're, I, you know, you're you're working really hard. You're you're going. So you're doing a bunch of you're, the, the tour. You were. Yes, I'm about. on tour. You're on tour. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're just a good transition, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just came from Baltimore. Speaking of my parents, they brought all that their they brought their respective church choirs, <laughs> um, who all bought the book for their like just out of the closet grandchildren and nephews. <laughs> this whole moment was like, this is for Tommy. He <laughs> just came out. <laughs> so I was like, Tommy, welcome. <laughs> Didn't know what to say, um, but um, yeah, we were just in Baltimore, and now we leave tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. We're going to Provincetown. Um, sold about eight tickets there, so if you know people in Provincetown, please tell them. Uh, we'll we'll get them in. But um, and then we go to San Francisco in July and and L.A. after that. So have you thought about what you want to do next in terms of your writing? <sighs> um, yeah, I kind of, I, I, you know, I, I would like to write another play, maybe. I would like to write another book. I um, would like to write a TV show. I, I do think there is something in here that could be TV friendly. Uh, uh, cable. Um, <laughs> but, because we need dicks. Um, <laughs> won't do it without the dicks. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. That that's such a vague answer. I mean, I'm I'm really th this is a bit of a whirlwind time, but I'm really looking. You know, I left my job. I'm working for a real lunatic right now myself. Um, so I'm uh, I'm looking forward to uh, some downtime and just sort of uh, generate. You know, think, thinking generatively again. I'm excited for that. Um, but right now, I just refresh Facebook, which feels creative. Um, since we should probably, I guess, take questions from the crowd. Oh, geez. Which, there's a lot of people who want to ask a lot of questions. I'm so glad you all are here. Thanks. Anybody okay, want to start? Anybody want to start? Questions and comments? Mm -hmm. Oh, comments. Oh, sure. I'm going to bring you the mic. Just Baltimore's in the house. Yeah. Um, Baltimore's in the house. What's your best uh, Baltimore experience? <laughs> um, well, let's see. I blew a guy who was straight in high school, but gay now, in a car in the senior center parking. No, that's not a good. No, there's nothing. No, um, because that's it. Like, there's no story to that. Um, uh, there's no arc. Uh, just draw me back off at home. And, um, uh, no, I, well, one, it's one of the stories in the book. I have a whole section on, like, my childhood growing up in Baltimore and lots of fun photos. Uh, uh, I would say... Um, staging of producing, directing, writing,
casting and starring in uh, Catman versus Batman, Catman, Catwoman, excuse me, uh, Catwoman versus Batman on skates in, in the alley in our, behind our <laughs> apartment in downtown Baltimore. Um, how old were you when you did that? I was eight yeah. in my, uh, you know, and there were, there were women, there, there were girls present, but none of them, you know, had, had the sort of meow <laughs> factor <laughs> that I knew I could bring. So um, they, they were, I cast them as, you know, concerned citizens of Gotham and I was, you know, and, and all the like neighborhood parents came out and like sat, set up chairs along the alley and there's this little eight year old boy like rolling around in his mother's slip with like face paint and like <laughs> clawing at everybody. Um, <laughs> So that's Baltimore. That's a Baltimore story. That's actually one of my favorite parts of the book yeah. when you start well, thanks, covering Emily. some of the childhood stuff and then kind of the moment where you talk about there being a parent behind the camera. So can you speak a little more to some of the ways your parents have been supportive throughout sure. your writing and, and theater process? Um, well, other than reading the book and <laughs> asking me questions. Um, I should have sent them a glossary. Uh, no, they, oh God, I, I, lo I, I lucked out with my parents. I mean, they, as you will see from the photos, they really had a lot of time to grapple with who I was before, <laughs> before I did. So by the time, you know, I was sort of ready to come out to them, they were kind of like, Okay, chicken for dinner. Um, <laughs> so they, uh, um, it, it was it was relatively seamless, and they have been uh, very supportive. Um, considering my dad used to be a minister, and they're both, you know, religious people, but they are progressive religious people, which is wonderful, and um, and voices that we need. God uh, knows. Um, but, but, uh, God knows, but, uh, but my, uh, you know, they, they found my blog and read it for a full year before they told me that they had found it. And, you know, just one day, it, it would have been so different if they had said, we found your blog, what is this? You know, but they, I think they understood why I was writing it sort of separately from them, uh, away from them. And... They, they stumbled upon it because they're better at Google than I am, uh, putting my full goddamn name in a piece. But, um, uh, and, and then, and then, but they said, you know, we've been reading this for a year and, you know, some of it, we don't need to, some of it, you know, we don't really need to know, but, and we sort of skim through those, but, you know, we love it, we feel closer to you, we feel, um, like we know you better and uh and it's and it's been that way you know they come to the shows they get a little drunk um they've really started heckling a lot from the audience baltimore was a real you know call and response uh, i really have to speak to them about it um but you know they're they're supportive there, there's a cost i mean i sort of talk about that in the book too i mean they my mother now knows the phrase come on your face and things like that and you know she she said to me stop letting all these guys just come on your face and leave and she's like try and meet someone for something other than that um uh, uh, you know i mean they you know there there there's a cost to it but but it you know the benefits outweigh the costs, so, yeah. Any other questions or comments tonight? Um, have you heard back from the furry? No, or anyone, I, anyone I've heard from, from the two guys so far. Who thought, oh, from, from yeah, who are in the book. Right. Luckily, they were just <laughs> casual like mentions. <laughs> I've heard from two furries. Um, <laughs> no, I've heard from two of, two of the men um, who uh, are, are mentioned in the book. And luckily, they had great senses of humor about it. And, you know, we're reading the book. And, and they were very funny because one guy was like, I didn't know your name. And now I do. Um, <laughs> I was like, hey, right back at you, Mark. Um, so, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, they, they luckily have been, you know, so far, knock on wood. I mean, you know, we ran this through legal, uh, that, that was, you know, a bunch of times, but um, they, they, were, they, they were tickled by it. Um, but I've not heard from the furry, and he's out there. I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting. I'd like to see him again. <laughs> Hopefully he won't sue me. <laughs> Did he live in an apartment with other furries? Wasn't that a furry house? Furry house. Yeah. <laughs> in my neighborhood, Washington Heights, furries, furries, <laughs> northern furries. <laughs> I was uh, sorry. Uh, what was your writing process like? If you were working at night at the box office, like when did you when did you have time to write, or were you just at the box office and then went home and wrote all night long yeah. and slept? Yeah, I couldn't noon really write at the box office. I mean, I I would go home and sort of uh, you know watch like a couple Golden Girls and eat some horrible food I made for myself and have a couple glasses of wine and look at about an hour or two of porn and then. Um, an hour or two of Facebook and, um, you know, just a bunch, like nine tabs, just sort of <laughs> situation room uh, <laughs> interface. And then I would start, you know, I'd write from like one, like 1.30 to like 4.30 was when I would do it, which is not healthy, but I just, I need the world to be kind of done. You know, like I need the internet to be done, you know, like things are calming down, people are going to sleep and then... And then I can, you know, I need everything to be taken away from me. <laughs> and then I can write. Yeah. Was wondering when we might see Intimacy Idiot Hi. in a movie or TV. We're working on it. Working on it. Hopefully, hopefully soon. Yeah. Starring Anne Hathaway. No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's one of the next projects, is trying to figure that out. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so I think there's a part, um, there's some, I forget what essay it was in, but... Uh, I can tell you. Okay, so <laughs> um, maybe I'm misconstruing it or something, but when you were having like these meetings in some places and this woman said, it's a bit gay heavy. Oh, was yeah. that a thing? Yeah. Okay. So, have you heard anything about that? Was there any like talk? Is it too gay heavy? Because I know that's a lot of stuff. That, that's that was. I mean, w when we were trying to sell the book, a lot of people had that concern. A lot of people had that reaction. I had a woman say to me, "You know, I I, th I think it's just too specific. I think it's too." specific for an audience, which is just, I was like, well, this meeting is over because I disagree with that entire, I think what makes something relatable is the specificity of it. Um, and, and she also said to me, she's like, I mean, I think your hockey player story could be like a sidebar in, in a larger piece about sports. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, what about sports? And she was like, she was like, well, your thoughts on sports. And I was like, I have none. <laughs> I was like, this is a story about me sleeping with a hockey player who might now be dead. Uh, you know, like that's... <laughs> anyway. Um, so, so there were a lot of those meetings, but I have to say, luckily, luckily, I found Scribner, you know, and they never, never said anything like that to me. They embraced the material, and I... This cover, this fucking cover, they led with it. You know, they led with the the contents of the book you know they weren't apologizing for it or making excuses for it and and they've been that way from the get-go and i am so lucky lucky and thankful to them for that because i think we're ready for a new era now i think i think we don't we as gay writers don't have to be neutered anymore i think we also don't have to apologize for being a gay writer i don't think a gay writer is is a bad label you know i think i think there's really good gay writing you know and that horrible manager in la um who I'm dying to get a meeting with in July. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, she, you know, she said she she was like your it's a, your work is a little gay heavy, but it's still funny. And yeah, like people people just you know. I, but but I I hope I don't think we're there yet. But I think we're starting to 
um, not have to qualify things like that anymore. So, I don't know. Send all your gay books to Scribner because they're... <laughs> Wonderful. I love them. Yeah. Well, on behalf of Strand, thank you so much, thank Isaac you and Jason, so much. for joining us tonight.